Uh, Sheila, thanks so much for your presentation. I guess you've overtaken the uh, mentor. <laughs> okay, anyway, my, my topic is artificial intelligence. Uh, I've been involved in this issue for 15 years, uh, including the issue of technological singularity. How, how many of you are here in the area of artificial intelligence, just to get an idea? Nah. Machine learning? Okay. Yeah, thank you. So, um, when I was invited here, I uh, immediately accepted because I think this will be the crowd that would really understand uh, what humanity is facing with this issue. Uh, I, I, but I, I want to say that I was telling uh, my next speaker here, <laughs> the Ali, who's in robotics, I, uh, I asked her, please uh, take this as a, uh, not as an anti AI or artificial intelligence presentation, but a way to surface issues that are not uh, really normally discussed, but in fact uh, are the issues that humanity faces really tremendous challenges. So I'd like to start with a, uh, okay, just to get the perspective. Uh, the AI brain is a billion times faster than the human brain, which runs on bio, biochemical processes. So it performs a million times faster than the minds that created it. And most of the minds that created there are probably, will pass the Mensa test. <laughs> Classified test. Uh, there's a book out in uh, Silicon Valley, it's called Nerds and Geeks. Have you, have you heard that book? Yeah. Okay, great. At least one. <laughs> they make a great distinction between nerds and geeks. Nerds have very high IQ, but that's it. Geeks have the same high IQ, but have emotional and social intelligence on top of it. And, and this is basically uh, part of the challenge. How do we put a kind of social intelligence uh, to artificial intelligence, which is basically an externalization of the IQ. So you, you can take a look at this. Uh, so an AGI, which is a human level, artificial general intelligence, is a human level, can perform 2,000 years of human level work of a team of about 25 to 30 bright people, that the AGI can work that in one week. So therefore, it can perform one million years uh, of human work in one year. So, so you can immediately see the disparity because this will lead to something that uh, I'd like to flesh, flesh out a little bit more. And here's a little comparison with Mensa. So the IQ two years ago of an AI is 10,000. <laughs> so, and it's accelerating very fast with the development of supercomputers that can now calculate. Uh, people here from China, can you raise your hands please? Okay, great, welcome. Your country has the highest speed of supercomputers beating the United States. Uh, it's calculating over 100 quadrillion calculations per second. So it's super fast. And by the way, Google is going to break that record with a quantum computer that's going to be releasing this year. So, the, I mean, you can see the, the acceleration of technology on the hardware part, and then later on we'll see the acceleration of technology on the software part, the programming part. This is, this is there's an intelligence explosion. Okay, uh, the, that's, a no, that's a notion, the concept, that we are actually in the middle of today. And most people don't realize it until all of a sudden in 2016, 2017, AI was practically uh, front page almost every day in newspapers around the world. And uh, intelligence explosion is through the process of recursive self-improvement. I'll give you the classic uh, definition written by the guy who quoted the term uh, Intelligence explosion. He was a colleague of Turing. Anybody here from the UK? No, okay. Oh yeah, one. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, so Turing is a very famous, uh, and that's the Turing test, right? So that came from this guy, I.J. Good, who was his colleague during World War II that cracked the Nazi code using a computer. So uh, this is a quote from him. Let an ultra-intelligent machine, that's the AGI, the uh, artificial general intelligence, or the human level artificial intelligence, as contrasted to the narrow artificial intelligence that can just do specific functions, be defined as a machine that can surpass all intellectual activities of any man, however clever. Since the design of machines is one of those intellectual activities, an ultra-intelligent ultra machine can design even better machines. Because if it's human level, then it can invent its own software. And then so it can also design better machines. And so there would then unquestionably be an intelligence explosion, and the intelligence of man will be left far behind. And then he, this is the end of his public quote. But then there was a guy who discovered that there is a continuation to that quote in his uh, archives. But we'll end with a public quote. By the way, this is always quoted often when you, when you research about AI. Thus, the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last invention that man need ever make. Yeah, because the machine will... You know, there are, there are, there are AI now that can do that can rediscover previous scientific theories and create new ones and really successful and, and so on. Now here's the actual real quote. And this is this now the folder of debate in the AI community, provided that the machine is docile enough to tell us how to keep it under control. So that, that is the challenge. Because, uh, we will go into this later, this is called the Alignment Challenge. And, um, yeah, I'll, I'll develop it so you can, you can understand what, what that actually means. In other words, people believe since we created the machine, the machine will follow orders from us. N not with this kind of technological revolution. The machine, especially if it's uh, AGI, can start developing its own yeah, its own articulate understanding of objective functions that you program into it and the way to execute them. Okay, the first impact is on jobs, and this is discussion everywhere. I'm going to cite the example of the Philippines because I have data when I testified before the uh, Senate Committee on Science and Technology, they had a hearing on artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, the Philippines is, has become the center of the BPO. It employs 1.2, 1.5 million, and it's influenced another 4 to 5 million in other industries like 7-Eleven, 24-7, and so on, uh, Grab, Taxi, and all of this stuff. Now, um, so now the Philippine industry is actually threatened with extinction. And it's, the extinction process will be like uh, very clear in the next three to five years. It's very short. And for those of you who've seen uh, the YouTube on Google Duplex, how many of you have seen that? Okay, you should take a look at that. This is the technology that was already there, but then Google placed it in a small app. It basically actually does the agent response is intelligent enough to, to take over. So it's an automated process. And uh, so when, when that happens, uh, the, in the setting testimony of the BPO industry, the entire industry was present there, they estimated that the impact is 24 million people and about 20% of the GNP of the Philippines. <laughs> you can just imagine the massive impact in three to five years. But on the other hand, you, you can understand why they're creating the technology, right? So, but it has a downside. And uh, I'll, I'll give you later on a quote from Google, which is very interesting, a quote from the CEO of Google on this process. 
Okay, here is a guy, Tristan Harris. I don't know if you're familiar with him. I met him a few months ago in Chile on a global conference on artificial intelligence. He was one of the speakers. He actually confessed. He, he became a blow, whistleblower of Google. He was a design ethicist at, at Google. And he said that Google and Facebook are using their supercomputers to manipulate two billion minds in the planet. And this was done consciously. So how did he know? Because he was the one, one of those who designed it. So when you get, and, the, and that's why the Philippines is the world capital of Facebook. It's the largest base of Facebook. It's also the most number of hours. Four, four, anywhere from four to six hours. And therefore, therefore, Filipinos are the most addicted because this technology, basically what it talks about hijacks the mind, is actually designed to release dopamine neuropeptides in the brain, which are basically the same neuropeptides that are released when you take drugs. So this, but this was consciously done. There's a lot in YouTube that you can take a look, including the confession of the former president of Facebook, Sean Parker. They were very conscious, but they still did it. So anyway, I, people are saying maybe he should be brought to charge to court for criminal <laughs> offenses. So that's a discussion right now in the United States. But I, I, uh, there are many issues. There are many benefits to AI. Uh, when I was undersecretary of the country's Department of Environment, natural resources. We were, we were deploying, we're starting to deploy AI to actually rationalize, rationalize the silos of information inside the environment department. And But that project was cut short because the secretary was not confirmed uh, in the Congress. So the project was stopped. So I just wanted to mention that because I'm not an AI, anti-AI. But I just want to show where the challenges lie. And I think this is the kind of challenge which is which ideal for this group. I mean, you're, I mean, this looks some of the best minds in the planet. And you've got a crisis that would require the best minds and hearts of this planet. I mentioned heart also, because it's not enough to have high IQ. It's also important to have high EQ and SQ, social intelligence, so that we can create technologies that would benefit humanity. So in, in a sense, this is a challenge that's really for people in this room, and of course others, but people who are designing this technology could easily be members here of Mensa. So here is the intelligence explosion, and I'd just like to give you a sense of what that might mean. So th that is the progression, the emergence of human level, which I discussed earlier. And here's a very important stage. This is work. We're moving towards this. How soon are we going to move to human level, artificial intelligence? I'll show you a chart. And then shortly after, artificial super intelligence will emerge. Now, if, if the programmers, the people creating the AGI, do not figure out the alignment challenge. That, that artificial superintelligence, which will be created a few days, a few hours, a few, that it won't be long. Immediately after AGI, if it's not created properly, can actually turn against the creators. There are already several examples of this. And um, so, I mean, Putin, for example, mentioned a few months ago, the first country in the world that will have artificial super intelligence there and that will control the world. So Russia is into it, China is into it, the US is into it, and so on, Israel, Japan. It's a, it's a race. What's that? Five minutes? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so anyway, the, the thing that they don't see is that after they create that, the machine could turn against and destroy the creator. This is such a challenge that there was a conference in uh, California last year 
is called the Con a Global Conference on the on Beneficial Artificial Intelligence, and everybody was there, B all sides. Ray Kurzweil was there, Elon Musk, and all these people were debating in the public, they were, they were all there, and no one could resolve the alignment challenge. And so, okay, so, yeah, and okay, here, how soon? Uh, here's, the, here's the track record of predictions that were made by specific technologies, and all of them arrive an average of 10, an average of 17.5 years earlier than what than was projected. I cannot go now and explain each one. Can you see them? Predictions about translating languages, writing high school essays, driving a truck, working in retail, and so on, surgery. The most famous one is playing Go. Anybody, I mean, who are the group from South Korea? Yeah, please, I saw about 15 people here earlier. <laughs> South Korea, Lee Sido, was a world champion in Go, got defeated by Alpha Zero, Alpha Go. Uh, and after that, there was a survey taken in your country, South Korea, and 65% of the South Koreans said, AI will destroy humanity. It's very interesting because it was very visceral because Lee Sido is a hero in South Korea and in the world. And then a few months later, AlphaGo defeated, uh, I think I may have a picture of him, Ki. So, any Chinese from here? Yeah, Ki, what's his name? Ki Se Seiji, the, the world champion of Go. He, anyway, yeah, he got defeated also, 3 0, and that he was supposed to be the top. And then, but for me, the most important thing is what happened after. After that, a few months later, DeepMind of Google, they created AlphaZero, which did not have to be trained, unlike AlphaZero. And in a few months, it defeated AlphaGo, 100 is to zero. So this machine was just given the rules, and they, okay, go, find yourself. In a few hours, it started beating the world champion in chess. And after a few more hours, it started beating Alpha, <laughs> AlphaGo. So, so there are various predictions. The arrival is 2060 or 2045. But given that, it's closer to 10 to 24 years, given the track record. And this is not, because what's happening when people make this prediction is based on the past. But all this technology and software accelerating exponentially. So Elon Musk said things 2030, Maybe 2003, but 2030, and first one says 2029. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> so that's first one. Robots will be smarter than humans, 2029. Uh, Elon Musk. Oh, yeah. KG. KG. He's there, he's playing with <laughs> AlphaGo. And then. Uh, Okay, so this is the exemplar of the alignment challenge. You can you can program a robot to do an AI to do something, but it may not necessarily follow. And this was the famous Facebook example of August 2017, where the Facebook AI created its own program, and the programmers did not understand the language, and had to shut it down because it started communicating with other robots, and it was more efficient than the human programmers. So, by the way, this has also happened with Microsoft and other companies. That's just the most famous example. And so, you have the, the late Stephen Hawking making this prediction that if you're not careful with this, it could destroy humanity. I mean, somebody like Stephen Hawking, who's a very rigorous scientist, would say that I'm sure examine the facts. Okay, but here's the, I said, I promised the uh, organizers, and ends with some good news. First, the, the Silicon Valley cluster, the, the, the early inventors and executives are starting to realize the problem and they're starting to complain. So you would like to check Center for Humane Technology is, the, is where they're all going. 
joining forces, trying to solve all the range of challenges connected with artificial intelligence. And BlackRock, the world's largest investment house, they manage uh, $6 trillion. They sent this message. They're also really concerned. And that's really mainstream. And then, here, I received this from somebody in Silicon Valley last night. Uh, there are insiders that I'm in touch with in Silicon Valley who sent me, they, they just released this uh, two days ago. And Google had to release the, its AI principles because more than 3,000 employees wrote a petition against Google. And some of them have already resigned. A lot of people have resigned and more were threatening to resign because they found out Google was involved in the creation of weapons of destruction. And so they released seven principles. And, uh, but what's important here is uh, Sundar, Sundar Pichai, uh, Pichai's words. We recognize that such powerful technology raises equally powerful questions about its use. So now, there, we, as, the, as a leader in AI, we feel a deep responsibility to get this right. Because in reality, this is, not the, this is not a normal technology where you can mistakes, learn from it, and so on. There's no learning. If you don't get this right the first time, then AI will take over. Super intelligent AI. So, there's no, no time to go to the principles. You can check it out. Okay, these were part of the hope is, how many are familiar with this guy? You should be, because you're as a, you're geeks, I would use the word geeks. <laughs> yeah, Andrew Wells, he solved a theorem in mathematics that was supposed to be impossible to be solved. And this was the case for 350 years until in 1994, he finally showed the solution to Fermat's last theorem, a very famous mathematical problem considered impossible. The AI problem, alignment problem, is considered impossible today, but we're not sure. Maybe not enough minds are just putting their, their minds into this to really create a solution where AI can actually be used to, for benefit of humanity. That is the hope, because some were here, but we need to actually cross-culturally, have cross-cultural dialogues and so on. So I've actually been traveling around the world, meeting with different uh, AI scientists, and by the way, uh, they're really concerned. Whether they're from Japan, whether they're from Europe, whether they're from France, and, and so I meet them personally, even China. And so, yeah. I, I'm just gonna leave it here because I would really like to get in touch with all those in the room who feel a connection to this challenge. Uh, that's my email address. You will notice it's a Proton Mail. It's not Gmail. Proton Mail is the, is the most secure email in the world. And uh, many people in Silicon Valley who are from G Google use Proton Mail <laughs> because they know all your emails being stored and archived. And then there's a website, the fullyhuman.org. It's a website that tries to create a, an overview of everything. I mean, this cannot be captured here in 20 minutes, so yeah, I'll stop here. Thank you very much.